Disclaimer. Many of Polanski's films are based on existing works or original screenplays written by other screenwriters. For the sake of simplicity, and because it can often be difficult to figure out what has been added by who, I will be referring to the characters, dialogue, and plot of many of these films as if they are solely Polanski's for the most part. But be aware there are many talented writers behind these works beyond Polanski himself. Roman Polanski is the most controversial director still working today. Those who adore his work proclaim him to be a genius with an almost unmatched collection of intelligent, thrilling, and incisive films. Those who hate him have mostly one very significant reason to do so. His 1977 rape of a 13-year-old child and subsequent fleeing of justice. There is something Shakespearean in the drama of Polanski's own life, more dramatic than even the best of his films. Escaping a Warsaw ghetto as a child and fleeing guards, playing a central, tragic role in the Manson family murders, and through all of this, consistently creating many of the greatest films of all time. My intention with this piece isn't to debate the morality of watching Polanski's films. It's intended to be an analysis of his art, rather than a sociological think piece. I want to discover what underpins Polanski's films, how he manages to maintain a signature style through different tones, genres, and decades. It starts immediately with, a polished and precise style is immediately apparent in Polanski's early short films, many of which are surrealist pantomime exercises. Immediately, it's clear Polanski has a clarity of focus in his films, whether they are a slapstick comedy, a semi-documentary horror, or a fantastical sketch. In each film, it is clear what Polanski is trying to say, and importantly, his films already deal mostly with original ideas, rather than the pastiche of other directors that usually begin the career of a filmmaker. His most significant early shorts are Two Men in a Wardrobe, from 1958, and When Angels Fall. Both of these films are dialogue-free, focusing instead on visual storytelling, a conscious choice by Polanski, who declared that short films worked best without dialogue. Two Men in a Wardrobe is a prototype of the immigration allegory that the tenant would later be. Two men emerge from the sea with a large wardrobe in the arresting opening shot, and from there they are shunned by everyone. It presents a sociopathic, hostile society that barely has any empathy for its insiders, let alone those outside of it. Eventually, the men, met by violence all around them, go back into the sea. The first of Polanski's elliptical stories. When Angels Fall is more recognizable as a student film, with some labored religious symbolism and cliched scenarios. However, in this film we also see some of Polanski's earliest successes at creating beautiful professional shots, something which was soon to become a defining feature of his craft. After his short films in the preceding years, Polanski's first directorial outing was feature length as Knife in the Water from 1962. Polanski is the kind of director with so many canonized and socially popular works that it seems likely the average viewer will have seen at least one of his other pictures before they dive into Knife in the Water. This was my perspective upon entering the film, and it's immediately surprising to see a film that has only the beginnings of the technical polish of his other works. This is his only film in a 4 by 3 aspect ratio to date, and the cinematography feels spontaneous and imperfect a far cry from the meticulous compositions of each following work. None of this is to criticize the film, it adds greatly to the sense of creeping danger, baked into the taut script written by Jerzy Skolomowski, who would go on to direct the folk horror film The Shout. The low-budget nature may give it some underdog charm, but this is not a film to be patronized. It's one of the best films of 1962. Without the money to add dozens of locations and cast members, the action is condensed to the interactions between a couple and a hiker, who end up together on a small boat in the middle of the sea. Polanski's interest in group dynamics and the evil within human nature present themselves immediately. Many, if not all, of his films can be boiled to a core idea of an unsuspecting and unprepared character entering a conspiracy that only gets more outlandish the more the protagonist discovers. Knife in the Water does not end in the total tragedy or the crazed left hook of many of his works, but it's still an unpleasant presentation of a queasy situation. The conspiracy here is domestic. The husband, sexually threatened by the youth and good looks of the hitchhiker, insults and humiliates him, ignoring the pushback from his mediating wife. This eventually flips and the hitchhiker uses an argument that separates the husband and wife as an opportunity to seduce the wife before leaving. 
The focus is on the recognizable but unspoken competition between the two men. When the hitchhiker quips about an odd-looking detachable pot handle used by the husband to move a boiling pot of soup, the husband angrily forces him to try and move the pot without using it. The hitchhiker immediately drops the boiling pot, spilling his soup. This is the format for much of the conflict in the first half of the picture, as the husband uses his ownership of the boat and his knowledge of sailing to keep the hitchhiker's arrogance at bay. It's only when the husband's wife becomes involved in the conflict that the positions in the small hierarchy begin to shift. Polanski seems to present the wife as a woman who ultimately manages to very subtly create a situation where she is able to cheat and get away with it. This would be misogynistic if it wasn't for the emphasis on the poor relationship the husband and wife have, making her actions quite understandable. The husband alternates between total neglect for his wife, as when he would rather listen to the boxing match than listen to her sing, and using her as a tool in his tiny war against the hitchhiker. When the wife eventually does cheat, it feels as if it has been a long time coming. Throughout this film, we also see another of Polanski's favorite tricks for the first time, having the dynamics between characters change throughout a film as more information is revealed, thus changing the audience's allegiance over the course of a picture. Here, the arrogant and rude hitchhiker starts off as a clueless annoyance, forcing the husband and wife to almost crash their car when he steps into the road to make them stop, foreshadowing the disaster he's about to inflict on their marriage. However, on the boat, the husband is revealed to be an insecure brute, culminating in him pushing the hitchhiker off the boat in an attack that has been silently provoked the whole film. He searches desperately for the boy until he gives up, convinced he is drowned. He and his wife have an altercation with the high stress and he swims away. Only now the hiker reveals himself to have been hiding behind a boy, proceeding to make love with the wife. When the wife returns to shore, she tells the husband what's happened. So convinced the boy is dead, the husband seems to reject the wife's alibi as a cruel joke. There is a sense that maybe he chooses to believe what would be less painful for him to hear. Polanski suggests that this man would rather kill another man than be cheated on. An ironic ending, since the audience knows that his worst fear is exactly what has happened. The hitchhiker is shown as the truly dangerous force on the boat, able to learn from his errors and overcome an alpha male figure through cheap tricks. Although we meet him as an expert of land, a hitchhiker who regularly walks for miles, he gradually adapts to the sea until he is able to use it to his own advantage by hiding within it. This kind of adaptation process is something Polanski will return to in Frantic and The Pianist. There is a class element to the process too, with Polanski suggesting that the middle class husband is unwilling to adapt his tactics to suit the situation due to complacency, while the hitchhiker with nothing to lose wins through his flexibility. At many points, the film mirrors, consciously or otherwise, the shock of La Ventura, 1960, by turning the ocean into a place of isolation and deceit. Both films have vital beats where the character goes missing in the ocean. Like Antonioni, Polanski successfully realizes a very specific kind of desperation that comes over the characters as they try to search for the missing person, the sea adding a whole new dimension for the body to disappear into. Missing people will come back again in several of Polanski's films. Repulsion from 1965 immediately shows a vast technical improvement over Knife in the Water due to a higher budget and likely also since they can now shoot on dry land rather than the middle of the sea. Despite this, it can often feel as if we are still adrift in the middle of a violent ocean. The mind of Catherine Deneuve's protagonist, Carol. Polanski's most intensely distressing film, a suffocating atmosphere is built from Carol up. Like Cassavetti's A Woman Under the Influence, the world itself seems to reflect what we can see from the character's subjective perspective. This is made very literal in the nightmare scenes where Carol is raped by imaginary men and groped by arms in the walls, but also implied through the black and white London that is reduced to its grossest and shabbiest areas. She walks repeatedly through a section of street covered in piles of dusty bricks and never-ending roadworks. The plot is again simple, but it matters less as the plot is used to probe deeply into Carol and how she responds to different situations. On the surface, Carol seems to be a disassociated toddler turned adult. At the beginning of the film, she is able to do extremely simple tasks like painting the nails of elite women at a salon. 
she also seems able to communicate to a basic level. There is clearly something a little off about her, as if she is constantly distracted. This unravels totally as soon as Carol's more down-to-earth sister leaves for a holiday with her boyfriend. This feeling of distraction reveals itself to be a kind of deep-seated sexual trauma. The last frame of the film shows a broken photograph featuring Carol as a child staring hatefully at a man, presumably her father. While this is often called an open ending, it seems obvious to me that the implication here is that Carol was sexually abused by her father. Her trauma is clearly sexual in nature, implying a history of sex abuse, which when combined with her phobia of men means this likely happened in childhood. But most importantly, a director as detailed as Polanski wouldn't end the film on a meaningless photograph. The biggest issue the film faces is in its own conception. The whole film is an armchair psychology analysis of a woman by a man, and is rendered in exploitative terms. This is countered through the extent that Carol as a character is a collaboration between Polanski and Catherine Deneuve, who gives the first truly incredible performance in a Polanski picture. A character who is defined more through inaction than action, she gives a performance that reminds me of Monica Vitti in Red Desert, a woman who seems magnetically repelled from the world around her, sliding and shifting like a person with a fever trying to get comfortable under hot bedsheets. Another similarity to Antonioni's work. The nightmarish rape scenes are certainly distressing, which is exactly their point. By committing to show the world from her perspective, her nightmares must be rendered in full terror. There's no erotic pleasure in these sequences either. The men are ugly, there is no nudity, and the sound is distressing. They happen abruptly and without build-up, acting as a sickening jump scare. All of this makes the film sound difficult to sit through, but there is also an undercurrent of dark humor to many scenes. Carol is hounded down by Colin, who seems respectable and friendly to begin with, and injects some warmth into the story and the potential of a happy ending. Unfortunately, as in A Knife in the Water, the audience begins to resent Colin. Frustrated by the odd, disassociative responses he is getting, or in many cases not getting, from Carol, he forcefully kisses her and later breaks down her door in frustration as she begins to become terrified by his hostile sexual drive. Of course, he gets brutally murdered by Carol. Even more distressing and funny at once is the landlord who Carol forgets to pay. The kind of totally irredeemable stereotype of a fat, ugly landlord that Polanski clearly had enough personal experience with to later make the tenant, it takes him only minutes to attempt to rape Carol, finding her impossibly attractive despite her half-destroyed apartment clearly signaling she is in need of mental help. Carol's murder of the landlord does not have the moral grey of Colin's murder, and his final fate, left lazily under a sofa not even discovered by the mob of neighbours that enters the flat at the film's end, shows precisely how little Polanski thinks of his type. Finally, the boyfriend of Carol's sister ends her story with a chilling implication of further abuse beyond the end of the film. Carol is found catatonic, traumatized after the events of the film, and the boyfriend carries her out, as if to take her to an ambulance. But registering her inability to defend herself, he has a look that suggests he is getting a dark idea, the same idea that all the other men in the film have had. It is a world where sexuality is taken to its most primal extremes. All men as rapists, and Carol as the endlessly raped. Repulsion is usually named as part of an apartment trilogy with The Tenant and Rosemary's Baby. Although Watts and Carnage are also based around characters going crazy within an apartment, what links these earlier films is that they each analyze the horrors of modern isolation. Once again, perhaps inspired by Antonioni's films, they each posit that the method of apartment living, totally isolated and yet also surrounded by those you do not know at all, creates both an inward psychological hell and an outwardly hostile environment of others. Polanski posits that the isolation of apartment living grows the selfishness in all people and leads to exploitation. Polanski gives many reasons why Carol has gone insane, but it is important to realize that Carol only goes totally insane once she is left alone. In fact, she acts much the way a small child would, who has no idea of how to function in the adult world, never cleaning, barely leaving the house. As he will suggest again Rosemary's baby and the tenant, having to fend for yourself in a world of strangers with bad intentions is hellish enough to deserve multiple horror stories. 
What Repulsion also has in common with Polanski's other films is that it reveals his interest in the minds of women, and how they can be broken. Despite his real-world actions, Polanski always seems to be on the side of these women, as they are destroyed by misogynistic, aggressive men. Cul-de-sac and the Fearless Vampire Killers Polanski has said that he made many of his most famous films as a means to an end, including Repulsion and Rosemary's Baby. Those ends tended to be more comedic works, with Polanski seemingly thinking that audiences would gladly watch his bleak, nihilistic thrillers, but would be less likely to watch his silly affair. Box office results and film history have proven this assumption to be correct. The first of these passion projects is Cul-de-sac, a suitably odd discussion of the weakness of the elite in their sexual depravity, offset with a hulking criminal. It's worthy of viewing for Polanski completionists, but is otherwise a little lacking in a hook. The best part of the film, The Criminal, is kind of a test run for Pirate's Captain Red. The Fearless Vampire Kills is a more accessible and traditional story, not just compared to Cul-de-sac, but to all of Polanski's previous feature films. A vampire-killing spoof film, it is mostly notable for showing Sharon Tate and Roman Polanski on screen together for the first and only time. It also, perhaps, gives insight on why Polanski never made another pure comedy. Many of the performances feel pulled straight from a European pantomime, exacerbated by the accents of everybody but Tate. The story is also unsurprisingly far more predictable than in most of Polanski's films, removing one of his usual strengths. However, there is still a lot of fun to be had, and it's easily one of the better horror movie spoofs of the time. It only suffers in retrospect because vampire movie spoofs have never significantly differed from the fearless vampire killers. If The Fearless Vampire Killers is a horror movie played for maximum laughs with ridiculous over-the-top caricatures, then the first genius idea of Rosemary's Baby lies in turning witches, one of the most caricatured and silly of all horror icons, into insidiously everyday evil. In its combination of black humor, constant rising tension, brilliantly realized sequences, technical perfection, and combination of supernatural and domestic horror, I believe Rosemary's Baby to be the finest pure horror ever made. That is, a horror film that does not wander into the hyper-experimental realm of Persona and Lost Highway. We start with a gliding shot that comes to rest over a block of apartments that immediately announces Polanski's move to America. Although the performances in Repulsion are also fantastic, there is an immediate increase in the average charisma of actors here, who we meet as they are being shown around their new apartment full of plants. Dylan Farrow plays the titular Rosemary to perfection. Although she seems innocent and naive to begin with, she is proven to have more agency than Repulsion's Carol. Much of the horror still comes from her childlike helplessness, but she is at least capable and intelligent enough to win the audience over. She is one of the most likable characters in any Polanski film, giving this film an edge on the majority of his other films, aside from perhaps the pianist in this regard. By having a character, their audience relates to at its center. Equally good and perfectly cast is John Cassavetes as Rosemary's husband, Guy Woodhouse, who unlike Farrow and Polanski, managed to mostly avoid the curse this film seemingly carried along with it into the real world. Ironic, since his character sells his soul to the devil. Not only is it a joy to watch Cassavetes act as a fan of his directing work, but he manages to absolutely convince as a man who seems likeable until he commits the worst act possible in order to become successful. It's the subtleties in his performance that make re-watching the film so rewarding, how he deceives his wife for his own benefit while trying to keep her on his side. The pacing in this film is also one of its greatest strengths, as well as one of Polanski's greatest strengths overall as a director. Many horror films rely on a familiar structure, either because it will sell the film better or because it is simply easier to follow in a windbroken path than to innovate. Rosemary's Baby dispenses with traditional structure because it has no choice. The story about a neighborhood of witches gradually breeding the child of Satan as the mother realizes something is wrong could be hundreds of years old, but many of the contemporary editions, God is Dead, the advent of the birth control pill take the story to a very different conclusion than it would have had in more God-fearing times. 
The key to unlocking the ideology of the film comes when Rosemary sits in a doctor's office and picks up a Time magazine cover that reads, Few director's work is so devoid of a god as Polanski's, and it allows him to take his satanic story much further than had ever been seen before, especially within Hollywood, as he is able to treat the whole premise as a ridiculous joke while committing to the very real fear of Rosemary. At the same time, the American dream is satirized through Guy Woodhouse. The Woodhouse of his name suggests he may be a foil to the biblical Joseph, who is of course a carpenter, as the husband of the foil to Mary, Rosemary. The main difference being that while Joseph happily accepts the miraculous impregnation of Mary by God, Guy pimps out his wife to the devil in order to gain selfish and vain success in the film industry, itself idolatrous. Polanski suggests that despite the God-fearing Christianity of so many Americans, many of them actually characterize the total opposite of its teachings. There are comparisons to biblical stories too, Adam and Eve. To begin with, the apartment is brimming full of life. The Garden of Eden, filled with various terrariums which disappear quickly. Rosemary, like Eve, is corrupted by a demonic force that insists on her eating a corrupted food. That demonic force comes through perfectly in the other iconic performance of Rosemary's Baby. Ruth Gordon as Minnie and Sidney Blackmer as the winkingly named Roman Castavet, which is actually carried straight over from the novel that the book is adapted from. They play neighbors who are recognizable as pushy, nosy, and annoying, constantly worming their way into every possible situation. While this is initially funny, it quickly becomes part of the horror, with Minnie's constant invasions of the apartment being an example of Polanski building a supernatural horror from real-world unpleasantness. The fear of others' forcefulness and the inability to refuse the strong-willed. As in Repulsion, there are vivid nightmare sequences where Rosemary's experience is played as reality. Clearly the most expensive film Polanski has made up to this point by some distance, these dream sequences are rendered as nausea psychedelic vistas. We are introduced to the nightmares via a short sequence of Rosemary being punished at a Catholic nunnery. This seems inconsequential but is vital in establishing the ending of the film, showing that Rosemary has reason to disown the Catholic Church, and so moving towards an oddly accepting Satanist community is not as impossible as it would be for someone of unquestioned faith. Here, Polanski also makes the provocative claim that perhaps the death of God is not the fault of Satan, but the fault of a violent church that has induced victimhood within its followers. The filmmaking is full of more small tricks than any other Polanski film, as the subjective viewpoint of Rosemary allows some oddness in the form. The constantly changing layout and size of the rooms within the house are the most obvious examples of this, as the audience feels constantly bewildered and confused despite spending the majority of the film in the same location. There is a psychological idea that says humans are only comfortable in a place once they have explored every inch of every room within a house. We are not allowed that comfort here. The climax of the film comes unusually early, when Rosemary discovers that all of the people she seems to know are witches. This twist works by wrong-footing the audience. At this point, all but the least discerning viewer has worked out that the neighbors and doctor are witches, but the real horror comes when it is revealed that even the safe doctor Rosemary goes to see is himself a witch. Few films are able to convey helplessness so effectively, as Rosemary seems trapped in a labyrinth of dead ends even when she tries her best to get out. The ending of the film is what truly sets it apart from any other horror picture. Many genre films, including Polanski's own fearless vampire killers, are content to end on the imminent death of the protagonist. Indeed, the scene where Rosemary is held down on a bed by a crowd that has just invaded her house echoes the end of Repulsion. But after the baby is born, Rosemary can still hear its cries. Once again, the audience is wrong-footed. For a second, we believe the baby really did die and that Rosemary was going insane. After all, so many films end with reveals that the whole thing was a dream or a hallucination. But Rosemary finds something even more horrible. She walks through a wonderfully gothic set of hallways hidden behind her cupboard to find a congregation gathered around a black-veiled crib with an upended crucifix as a mobile, one of the funnier visual gags in the film. These secret hallways once again play on the fear of not feeling familiar within our own homes, being surprised by what should be comfortable. Going from horror to full-blown comedy in the last minutes, the film finally accepts the farcical stupidity of its premise, as the elderly Satanist chant, 
Hail Satan, with immense conviction. Overwhelmed and feeling a motherly bond with her deformed baby, Rosemary decides to finally join the Satanists after all. The comic ending is entirely unexpected, but works where so many other films fail. By acknowledging its silliness whilst paying off the rest of the story and having Rosemary finally get her baby. It reveals the film as not simply nihilistic, but in fact is an unconventional spin on a tale of the bond between mother and child, the oldest tale in human history. Even more so than in Repulsion, contemporary living is deeply criticized by Rosemary's baby, the apartment location becoming not only a prison and a trap, as well as a place the devil literally exists within, but also as the cause of all of the problems of the film. If the couple had never moved into the apartment, it seems nothing would have happened. The permeating sense of living in a space which you do not truly own is stronger here even than in Repulsion, exacerbated by Polanski's constantly shifting set that creates a continuing sense of unfamiliarity. Macbeth. The only Polanski film I saw in school was an edited version of Macbeth from 1971 It was shown to my 15-year-old English literature class instead of having us read the original text. That alone is a testament to the quality of this adaptation, which stands as perhaps the most definitive Macbeth adaptation amongst many. This was the film Polanski decided to make after the killing of his wife, Sharon Tate, and their unborn eight-month-old son. There has been more media attention around this event than around any of Polanski's films, and the exploitative, insensitive reporting and incessant rumors gave Polanski a deep mistrust of American media. I will not fixate on these bleak events, but it is easy to see why they may have inspired a Macbeth adaptation, when faced again with such seemingly pointless human evil. Macbeth is one of the greatest works of fiction ever created, perhaps below only some of Shakespeare's other plays. Even more so than Hamlet, it pinpoints a theme, guilt, with such horror and truth that it remains powerful to audiences hundreds of years later. Having to comprehend the motives of a senseless, violent slaughter, of course Polanski would be attracted to it. All of which is to say that Macbeth is not one of Polanski's very greatest films. It's very good, but it suffers the fate of all Shakespeare adaptations an impersonality that comes with adapting without radically altering one of the single most adapted texts of human history. It defeated Wells in his 1946 adaptation and Joel Cohen as recently as last year. Polanski does a better job, but Shakespeare feels like the main force at work rather than Polanski, and when looking at his filmography as a whole, it's easy to miss amongst more idiosyncratic works. Eschewing well-known screen stars in favor of actors with a combination of screen and Shakespeare on stage experience, this is a tale that feels much larger than it actually is. In reality, there are a few major characters in limited locations, not as limited as his chamber pieces of course, uh, but mostly Scottish countryside and Macbeth's castle. In comparison to previous film adaptations of Macbeth, this is much more gory, allowed by looser rules on censorship. Heads are lopped off, daggers root fountains of blood, and witches are startlingly nude, as in Rosemary's Baby. Polanski has not been repelled from showing intense violence by the events of his own life. The film is all the better for the blood and gore, and I'm sure Shakespeare would approve of it himself. The guilt Macbeth and his wife feel is far more pronounced when the deed is shown to be as bloody as the original play suggests. The first half of the film is as good of a Shakespeare adaptation as one could want. The effects, casting, and location are fantastic. John Finch plays a good Macbeth, starting off as charming and attractive before falling into madness and finally a hateable arrogance. Francesca Annis plays a merciless portrayal of Lady Macbeth devoid of any positive qualities at all until she becomes pitiable in her own madness by the end. The second third slows down and becomes slightly boring until the film climaxes again with the final battle within Macbeth's empty castle a clunky, ugly, and unpleasant fight scene, heavy with realism previously foreign to Western adaptations of sword fights. Polanski excels at the surreal sequences within the film. Banquo's ghost at the banquet, Macbeth seeing the vision of the dagger, the crazed bad trip induced by the witch's potion. In the end, this is one of the better Shakespeare adaptations, but not one of Polanski's most memorable efforts. What? What, 1972? 
seems to have been a victim of Polanski's own actions and the current climate of poisoned ideological reassessments of artists' work that seeks to find clues of their future crimes in works of their past. Any rare mention of what, written in the last six years, seems to be unable to evaluate the work as anything other than a psychoanalytical document in which Roman Polanski lays out nothing but malicious misogyny full of rape, which of course he condones and enjoys. What all of this analysis ignores is that the film is clearly satirizing the open-minded, perhaps too open-minded, naivety of a hippie who wanders into the less enlightened streets of Italy. From there she is saved by a group of decadent rich people. Things are immediately presented with the tone of an outrageous farce. When combined with many jokes about rape and sexual perversion, this may seem like Polanski treating the idea of rape as a joke. People who say this represents his future actions are ignoring hundreds of years of the presence of rape jokes, however tasteless through a contemporary perspective. Rather than a psychoanalytic collaboration, this is Polanski's addition to a long canon of similar material, which exists whether we ignore it or not. The legendary Marcello Mastriani plays a man destroyed by a meaningless life of pleasure as in La Dolce Vita and La Grande Bouffe. His old sea captain, bordering somewhere between schizophrenic madness and animalistic lust, provides a powerful and interesting driving force behind the often overly loose, hallucinatory story. The house is stuck in a strange time loop, less of a science fiction trope than a metaphor for decadence. Without jobs, families, religion, and endless money to spare, the characters fill their lives with empty sexual encounters. They are excited for a moment by a new arrival, but quickly fall back into their odd, unnatural routines. The film seems consciously designed to leave the feeling of a fever dream, the sensation of circling, of events repeating themselves over and over, a sense of vague distress. Maybe the most totally original film Polanski ever made, but not necessarily one of his best or required viewing, which may explain why almost nobody has seen it. Chinatown. Of all of Polanski's films, I surely have the least that is original to say about Chinatown. One of the most well-documented movies in history, every single thing that could be said about it has been said. It's the bleakest Polanski film by some distance, because rather than only focusing on a corrupted individual, like Repulsion, or a troubled state, such as in The Pianist, this film focuses on both. Robert Towne's revered screenplay finds an uncomfortable truth at the roots of Hollywood and America, with a focus on the people who end up as collateral damage in the grand plans of driven men. Jack Nicholson is private detective Jake Gitties, a neo-noir detective with almost no redeeming traits. He only begins the case reluctantly because he is paid to do so, and he ultimately fails to really create any change for the better. He's merely an observer to a game far too systemically rooted for him to change anything. Faye Dunaway plays Evelyn Mulray, a tragic reversal of the femme fatale character. Rather than deceptive, she is victimized, forced to hide the daughter she has had as a result of her father's rape. Of course, the one trope of the femme fatale she does follow is that she dies at the end. But even this death is messy and inconsequential. Her murder only allows her father, Noah Cross, access to his other daughter, and the removal of the one person who could truly incriminate him. The film takes place in an odd construction of LA. Filmed mostly during bright summer days, the darkness of a noir is replaced with the atmosphere of the drought that is going through the city. Whenever darkness does come, it is memorable and significant, such as in Polanski's appearance as a man dressed in white who cuts Jack Nicholson's nostril open upon discovering him spying on the reservoir. The world of Chinatown sucks all the fun and silliness out of the noir genre. Jake has a frenemy relationship with the police who seem to know who he is all too well, but this often feels tired and obligatory for both parties. The police are presented as very much part of the systemic corruption within America, one step above Noah Cross. They seem to work for Cross rather than the public, but at least let Jake go at the end of the film. Knowing he has so little power, there is no point holding him captive. Polanski's vision of LA is unsurprisingly at its bleakest, but it does not kill his passion for the filmmaking itself. He perfects an invisible style, allowing the characters and story to carry the emotional impact of the film while making sure that the pacing is excellent and the visuals are captivating. 
This is also a classic case of a unique colour scheme executed brilliantly. There is a consistent colour scheme of beiges, creams, greys and browns that managed to subtly place the film in the past, without the extravagance of a period piece. It gives a muted but still visually pleasing realism to the events. Chinatown is certainly one of Polanski's standout pictures. Unlike Macbeth, his influence over an already great script is clear, his personal collection to LA certainly informing the bleak presentation, and the casting is a work of genius in itself. Not to mention that the ending of the film was his own idea. Few films have had such an impact on a genre. Just as Hitchcock had released his final work, this revitalized the noir by giving it a new, bleaker template to work from. One that turns away from individual sociopaths and looks towards systemic corruption. It turned the character of a detective from a hero into a helpless observer. The Tenant, 1976. After inflicting terror on two infantile women in Repulsion and Rosemary's Baby, having what flop at the box office and making the ultra-bleak, humorless Chinatown in Macbeth, it seems Polanski thought that his next step would be to return once again to an analysis of modern living, isolation, madness, and a Kafkaesque sense of entrapment. This time through a wild comedic lens where he would play the protagonist himself. What results is one of his most important and original films. Combining the looser filmmaking of Watt with a more solid, meaningful story results in a charmingly strange horror film. The plot begins as a mirror of Rosemary's Baby, a new tenant shown around a seemingly normal gothic apartment that has been recently freed up by the death of the previous owner. In this case, the owner is not quite dead, but is lying cartoonishly bandaged up all over their body in a hospital. Polanski visits them, they screech and die on the spot. This fantastic opening is also the ending of the film, which similarly to Watts works in an endless cycle. The meaning behind this is different though, as rather than a parody of the emptiness of decadent pleasure, the loop here could represent a purgatorial hell for the protagonist, a schizophrenic breakdown, or suggest that cycles of discrimination are too inbuilt into human nature to truly defeat. This is also the film that most effectively combines Polanski's taut, precise direction with his humour. While fearless vampire killers and Watts are somewhat derailed by their emphasis on humour, the tenant is full of hilarious moments. In comparison to the neighbourly intrusions of Rosemary's Baby, humour is built here by making other tenants of the flat the oversensitive victims of Polanski's noise. The horror that is tapped into is the fear of the wrath of your neighbours the morning after a loud house party. The other fear that is played on is the loss of identity. As a foreigner, Polanski reveals his feeling that he can never be accepted by the suspicious community of natives, a concern which manifests itself in the film through Polanski's gradual transformation into the woman who used to rent the apartment but committed suicide. This sense of being a foreigner in a community permeates much of Polanski's work, Rosemary's Baby, Repulsion, what? And this is one of its most clear and autobiographical manifestations. Polanski's transformation into Simone, the dead woman, has been accused by some of transphobia. It is not. The horror is not of a man being turned into a woman, but of a foreigner being transformed into the literal identity of a native. The drag act is a culmination of smaller cases of mistaken identity. Polanski is encouraged to order Simone's favorite meal by an ex-lover, and from then on is given that meal without asking. Without his preferred cigarette brand, he begins to smoke the type that she enjoyed. The suggestion is that society molds outsiders into itself through subtle affirmations. Nobody really forces Polanski to do anything, but there is a sense of veiled threat behind these suggestions. Going further into psychotraumatic surrealism than in any of his other films, there are many memorable images, especially a sequence where children play football with Polanski's decapitated head. That sense of disconnected, aggressive psychological turmoil is the lasting feeling the film leaves. Unlike the other films in the Apartment trilogy, we never discover what was real and what was merely imagined. This is pure delirium. We now enter what is perhaps the most interesting period of Polanski's career, not because of the quality of the films he makes, but because of the relative lack of discussion over these films. Tess, from 1979. Tess is not at all a bad or unimpressive film. It's certainly not a film that is to my own tastes, with my dislike of period dramas and countryside settings. I much prefer films set within cities, which may be why Polanski appeals so much to me on the whole. 
Setting aside my own unfair personal issues with the film, this is the first film by Polanski that feels as if it could have potentially been made by another director. While Macbeth had enough of Polanski's usual themes, surreal visions, and odd photography to remain idiosyncratic, Tess succeeds in tastefulness to such an extreme that the crazed, deeply angry director of Knife in the Water through to the tenant seems from this point on permanently matured. While some of his later work suddenly returns to that previous state, there is a more conscious effort from Tess onwards to stick within more clearly defined genre rules and to experiment less. As with all the other Polanski films I am not so keen on, I do not have very much to say about Tess. It's certainly the first Polanski film you can show to your grandma and leave her relatively unscathed. The accent of Natasha Kinski as the titular character never quite works, and leaves Tess feeling slightly out of it for the whole movie. At three hours, this is the longest Polanski film by half an hour, and is his slowest work too. Many directors are fantastic at slowly paced filmmaking, and while Polanski still makes a very good attempt, he cannot start parts of the film from feeling a little boring. The source material of the film is classic literature, and indeed there is a novelistic sense to the storytelling, expansive and messy in the way that works brilliantly in a book, but less well when consumed in one sitting. Still, the story is compelling, and it has a film-friendly ending, although the utter stupidity of the character's decisions at the end are annoying. A tragedy of a beautiful woman manipulated, raped, and betrayed by men before taking her revenge and finally experiencing true love are suitably grand themes for a film that would win three Oscars. The only thing, other than Kinski's dodgy accent, that holds Tess back from being a great film is that, for all of its technical perfection, Without an idiosyncratic take on the source material, it's a film that will only ever be second place to the novel that it's based on. Pirates. For seven years, Polanski did not make any films. Not having made a film in seven years, with seemingly no awareness or a conscious disregard of what was popular with audiences in the mid-1980s, Polanski launched one of the stranger comebacks in film history. Notorious for his extreme, disturbed essays on alienation, xenophobia, debauchery, and nihilism, he returned to screens with a, a children's film about pirates, called Pirates. It's easy to see why such an outrageously over-the-top film with very little deeper meaning would have been frustrating for hungry critics in 1986, and a critical bashing followed. Perhaps because it was a commercial failure and a children's film, it remains one of Polanski's least seen and most poorly regarded works. In fact, it's brilliantly fun farce, with the most stereotypical swashbuckling, peg-legged pirate of all, Captain Red, performed with vigor in an unfairly criticized performance by Walter Matthau. Like the fearless vampire killers with a clearly huge production value, this is more pantomime than anything tasteful, but it plays into this campness. The genius stroke of the film that makes it better than almost any other film revolving around sea warfare is in making the pirate captain the protagonist of the film, rather than the villain. Unlike Jack Sparrow in Pirates of the Caribbean, who is almost certainly inspired by this very movie, Captain Red is a true pirate at heart. He is not fighting for any moral good, only his own survival, and as much gold as he can hold on to. This is established immediately in the opening scene as he decides he will kill his only companion frog, seemingly out of boredom and hunger. Captain Red is a lovable character despite this, completely entertaining whenever he is on screen. Viewer can imagine him as a villain in a regular sea-based film, the kind of villain who is much more interesting than the protagonist. He's an unusual character type to lead a large budget mainstream film, an older man playing a comedy role with no love interest of his own and no real inner conflict. He simply wants gold, and in the end, he gets it. Polanski has great fun playing on any and every pirate trope. There are frenzied mutinies, love affairs with attractive young royals, moustache twirling conquistadors, and a whole lot of imprisonment. If there is any message at all, it is of the insanity of the human condition a farcical parody of history and the stupidity of obsession with wealth. More than this, it is successful as an entertaining children's film. If I had seen Pirates as an 11 to 12 year old, I definitely would have enjoyed the scenes of rat eating, sword fighting, and the mad violence of the finale. As an adult, it maintains entertainment value through its technical perfection and farcical setups. While it's not thematically deep enough or stylistically original enough to be one of Polanski's greatest films, it's still a very fun diversion, and washes away any worries Polanski was about to start a predictable run of Oscar-friendly slow dramas after Tess. 
frantic. If the tenant showed Polanski slowly morphing into the woman who had previously rented his apartment, then frantic is Polanski slowly morphing into the director who had previously commanded the thriller genre, Alfred Hitchcock. Hitchcock is one of my absolute favorite directors. He's influenced my own filmmaking from an early age. I vividly remember even having a Hitchcock day at school where we had to create our own musical scores for the birds and make shadow puppets inspired by Psycho, as he was born in the same borough of London as I was. As such, I very much enjoy Frantic's take on the innocent, upper-middle-class man forced to become action hero against his will subgenre the Hitchcock pioneered with The 39 Steps, The Man Who Knew Too Much, Saboteur, and then perfected with North by Northwest, one of the greatest films of all time. Harrison Ford gets one of his best roles as Richard Walker, forced from his usual job as a surgeon to go on a jet-lagged search of his wife around Paris, despite barely speaking basic French. He is the Hitchcockian Cary Grant everyman, put into a world of drug abuse that Hitchcock was mostly too early for, although he was more interested in theft and murder anyway. Complete with the discovery of a wonderful MacGuffin in the form of a Statue of Liberty-shaped nuclear detonation device. Walker is a very intelligent and moral character, a departure from the more vulnerable, naive, or malicious and manipulative protagonists of Polanski's previous films. It is a lot of fun to see him figure his way out of precarious, dangerous situations, once again reminding the viewer of Cary Grant's escapades in North by Northwest. Although she may be less famous than Harrison Ford, Emmanuel Seigneur's debut Polanski performance is much more significant for his filmography, and indeed his biography. Seigneur was not only destined to soon become Polanski's third wife, a relationship which continues to the present day, but also his most frequent collaborator, starring in more or less every other Polanski film from Frantic onwards. Her performance in Frantic is good, but it will be overshadowed by more impressive powerhouse roles from her in the future. She plays a femme fatale, doomed to a tragic death at the end of the film in the process of defeating the drug lords who she has become embroiled with. Because of Walker's commitment to his wife, there is thankfully an avoidance of the iffy, older man, younger woman romance that occurs in so many thrillers. There is a hint of this, but it never descends into what can often feel like the pornographic fantasy of the writer or director. Frantic mixes Parisian icons with the grimy underbelly of the city. Much of the dirty work happens in cocaine-filled nightclubs, empty car park complexes, and filthy apartments. In An Ota Saboteur, the climax of the film takes place under the Parisian sister statue to the Statue of Liberty. As is often the case in the genre, the intention of this noir is to expose the messy network of debauchery that thrives under the veneer of a classy, domesticated city. The end of the film, where Walker is reunited with his wife but in the process loses his new ally, Seigneur's Michel, is conventional but effective stuff, as all of Frantic is conventional but effective. In a reversion of Tess, which told a complex classic story but lacked idiosyncrasy in its direction, Frantic tells a simple Hollywood story but with passionate, memorable direction. Once again, this is not Polanski's very best work, but it's still a worthy addition to his filmography. Bitter Moon, 1992. My reason for recording this essay can in many ways be traced back to the feeling I had upon finishing my inaugural viewing of Bitter Moon. Rarely has a film left me with such a sense of crushing defeat, whistling over a baseline of unpleasant discomfort. Most of all, I was surprised I'd never even heard of Bitter Moon before. I believe it to be the greatest erotic thriller ever created. It is easy to see why this film has remained obscure, even despite having Hugh Grant in a leading role. It teeters on a thin line between emotional vulnerability and sentimentality, between a disturbing sense of growing madness and extreme silliness. The inclusion of Hugh Grant may lead viewers to expect a comedy rather than a camp but brutally intense erotic drama. I imagine it would only take a sly comment from an onlooker in a cinema to make obvious how ridiculous many scenes are. Bitter Moon is relentlessly silly. But once the surface is penetrated, there is a deeply twisted tale that manages to inspire intense feelings few other films can. I was never expecting a Polanski film to make me feel the same desperate, profound sadness that films like In the Mood for Love, Magnolia, and Mulholland Drive had inspired in me when I was younger. No matter how I feel about those films today, they are films that bound me to cinema as an art form I could find personal solace in. And Somehow Bitter Moon came out of nowhere to be the first film in years to enter this bubble. 
If Emmanuel Seigneur's inclusion in Frantic felt slightly nepotistic, here she gives a wild and brave performance. Her character, Mimi, is a femme fatale object of Nigel, Hugh Grant's character's affection, as he tries to cheat on his seemingly more ordinary wife, Fiona, played by Kristen Scott Thomas. Mimi is given a great deal more depth than surely any other woman in an erotic thriller, as her wheelchair-bound husband Oscar, played by Peter Coyote, relays the story of their relationship to Nigel over the course of several nights stuck on board a holiday cruiser approaching New Year's Eve. The structure is unique and unpredictable. This allows events to become shocking without feeling cheap, as the audience has no idea where the story will go next. The framing device of the story allows for intercutting between subjective flashbacks told by Oscar and the objective reality of Nigel's escape aids on the boat. This allows for two parallel storylines to pick up momentum in a plausible, satisfying way, which makes the climax of the film where the two storylines meet doubly powerful. What makes Bittermoon so repulsive to many, but so effective to the rest of us, is that the eroticism is very pronounced, often vulgar. Several scenes have the explicit nature of a softcore porn film, but with the excellent timing, directing, and cinematography of a Hollywood movie. It's an uncomfortable mix, the rare erotic thriller that dares to actually sexually arouse its audience in order to make its later emotional impacts more horrifying. Like Polanski's other masterpieces, there is much more than just a single idea being explored here. If the film was only a retelling of Mimi and Oscar's relationship, it would still be interesting as an observation of a hypertoxic relationship between two intelligent people purposely taking out bottomless revenge on each other. However, by contrasting this story with Nigel and Fiona's more traditional, upper-middle-class marriage of mediocrity, it is suggesting that below this surface of plight boredom lies a real hell of destructive hatred and resentment. Perhaps the main goal of Bitter Moon is to make the viewer consider why relationships turn sour, and whether this means that love is impossible. Could true love itself be so intense that it must turn those who fall into it into wounded, resentful avengers? This feels like one of Polanski's largest scale films, although much of it does take place within Oscar and Mimi's shared apartments and the boat itself. In a novelistic touch, the time span is greater than most films, and as a result, there are many individual scenes that stick in the memory. But the most iconic scene is also the most shocking. Having just watched several scenes of Mimi and Oscar having passionate sex, the audience lets their guard down for a morning time breakfast table scene. Oscar eats breakfast and Mimi drinks milk. George Michael's bouncy Faith begins playing on the radio. To this subversive song that combines a catchy, pop-friendly hook with horny, come-on lyrics, Sinier suddenly opens up her robe to reveal her breasts and pours milk all over herself, leading to another sex scene, punctuated by the toast popping out of a toaster at the moment of climax. This is exemplary of the initially silly but ultimately provocative and unforgettable nature of the film. It manages to convey the excitement of an unexpectedly immediate sexual encounter by making it just as surprising for the audience. Nigel's altogether less interesting relationship is itself questioned and transformed through his interaction with this very volatile couple. Once again, Polanski subverts the audience's unconscious expectations as rom-com lead Hugh Grant plays a man who turns out to be an awkward, weak loser when faced with a truly sexual force. His politeness turns to embarrassing desperation at the climax of the film, where Mimi dances alone to the symbolically chosen soundtrack of Brian Ferry's Slave to Love during the New Year's Eve festivities. He cannot bring himself, having now heard the full story of their relationship, to dance with her, not out of moral goodness, but out of a fear of her and Oscar. In the end, it turns out Mimi and Fiona have slept together in front of Oscar. As a final act of vengeance, Oscar shoots Mimi dead and then himself, the inevitable end of their relationship has come. It's a nihilistic conclusion to their story, but it leaves Nigel and Fiona with some hope. Through this couple, they have seen a dark reflection of what they were at the very early stages of becoming, and perhaps will now be able to overcome their issues. Polanski's look at relationships is incredibly bitter. The suggestion is that men get bored of even the most avidly sexual woman and will cheat as soon as there is an opportunity. The view of women is more sympathetic but equally tragic, in that their love is so intense that it will survive pretty much anything and everything that is thrown at it. 
This is shown in Bitter Moon to be a curse that rids Mimi of any possibility of happiness. After this film, the morality of Polanski's work is never so twisted again. Perhaps settling down with Seigneur and beginning a family of his own quelled his psychological anguish. We never get another Polanski film that seems so convinced of the evils within all men. From beyond Bitter Moon, the characters are never as wholly despicable again, and we don't get a descent into totally original, sexually tortured madness. Not just a Bitter Moon, but also Rosemary's Baby, Repulsion, What, The Tenant, and Chinatown again, until the more sanitized comedic slant of Venus and Furs. Bitter Moon is a tough sell for many viewers, but I would suggest that if you are watching this, then you make some effort to see the movie. You may hate it, but you will certainly remember it. And if you love it, you will love it in the horrible, wicked way that Mimi loves Oscar. Death and the Maiden On the surface, Death and the Maiden seems like a minor Polanski picture. It is the first of several mostly single location play adaptations he will make, and like the rest of his 90s films, has not had much critical attention. However, Kate within the seemingly standard Polanski fare is a Catholic-style confession of guilt that can very much be seen as Polanski speaking through another man's play. It is easy to draw comparisons with Polanski's own life and the core conflict of the film. Sigourney Weaver's Paulina Escobar has to convince her lawyer husband Gerardo, played by Stuart Wilson, that the man who has escorted him back home, Ben Kingsley, and has stayed over as a guest is the same man who has raped her multiple times when she was the prisoner of a South American dictatorship, traumatizing her. There is something a little shaky about the premise of the film in that it relies on a huge convenience that the man who raped a blindfolded woman unknowingly returns to her house many years later. This is papered over just enough by the logic of the plot. Other than this hurdle, the film is effective. Performances are, as always, fantastic, with Kingsley being given the most interesting role of the trio as a man who is pitiable, intelligent, and a monster. Although it can be argued that Bitter Moon got there just before it, this is also the first Polanski film where a woman truly has the power. Compared with Repulsion, this is a woman who has used her trauma to become hugely adept at self-defense. The film manages to pull off the trick of placing the audience in doubt, vital to its success. The extent that the viewer believes Polina will directly influence the emotional effect of the scenes where Kingsley's character, Roberto Miranda, is physically assaulted or humiliated. As one of the most talented and versatile actors of his generation, and perhaps of all time, Kingsley is able to pull off innocence so well that we want him to be innocent. Of course, it is maybe predictable in the world of drama that Miranda did indeed rape Polina multiple times. In his confessional final monologue, it is difficult not to read what he says as Polanski's own confession. He talks in detail about his rape, how he orchestrated them, how he enjoyed them, how he wishes he could still rape. While this last one especially doesn't necessarily apply to Polanski, even in 1994 it was a very rare and as a result very shocking admittance of the power-mad shadow we all have somewhere inside of us. Satisfied with his confession, Polina spares him. Up to this point, I have mostly avoided mentioning Polanski's rape of Samantha Gamer, as it was already as widely publicized as any other aspect of his life. Here, I think Polanski wants his audience to acknowledge it, within Death and a Maiden. In the confession of a man who admits he has done some of the most evil things imaginable, he mirrors his own odd relationship with his victim, who has ended up becoming one of the most influential advocates for his freedom. Reality is often stranger than fiction. Gamer's autobiography was subtitled A Life in the Shadow of Roman Polanski, and this is telling in how much the case affected her life. Discussion around sexual abuse can often lack clarity and nuance, as people are immediately painted as irredeemably evil and forever victimized by these events. The reality is much knottier and more difficult. Seemingly good people can do evil things, and people can have evil things done to them and react in unexpected ways. Polanski grew up in Warsaw, with his mother killed in a concentration camp. Then his first wife was murdered, eight months pregnant with his son in one of the most publicized news stories of the 60s. None of this is to diminish the horror of his rape, but it is to show that outside of a simplified, media-friendly discourse of good and evil, it is often the case that victims of unspeakable suffering can often end up repeating similar suffering onto others. 
To dismiss or downplay Polanski's crime as foolish, but it is equally foolish to dismiss Polanski and his work as irredeemably wicked. Both extremes come from an attempt to avoid the discomfort that comes with accepting that Polanski is a child rapist, Polanski is a great artist, Polanski is a husband and a father, and Polanski is a traumatized victim are all non-contradictory realities that make up this man. Should he have been imprisoned? Personally, I think he should have been imprisoned, or at least psychologically institutionalized, in line with anybody else who has committed an act as he did and is liable to do it again. I think it was a real miscarriage of justice that he got away, and I think a lot of it was because of the wealth and power that he had within Hollywood at the time. But the reality is that he did continue to make films, films I love, that are deeply meaningful to me, such as Bitter Moon. It is possible for me to find an odd solace in these films that I can simultaneously believe should not have existed. Solace in the idea, I suppose, that beautiful work can be found in hell. The Ninth Gate, 1999. Following that potentially controversial chapter, it feels odd to have to immediately write about one of Polanski's least significant and silliest works. The release of the film in 1999, an inversion of 666, is maybe the most amusing thing about it. It's still a generally good film, certainly a cut above what the majority of directors would create if asked to make a film about Johnny Depp trying to find the differences in three books that have the ability to summon the devil. From the cheesy CGI opening titles where we fly through various grand gates, it's clear we're back in the world of entertainment after a decade of dark and depressing films. Depp is one of the less interesting Polanski protagonists, serviceable but not likeable or complex enough to be anything other than a vessel for the story. Most scenes are reminiscent of others Polanski has already created, unconventional Satanists from Mo Rosemary's Baby, the location-hopping detective work of Chinatown, even a primary base in a hotel that is reminiscent of Frantic. Emmanuel Seigneur is enjoyable as a witch who inevitably has a possibly demonic sex with Johnny Depp at the end of the film. She may in fact be the devil herself. The meaning of the film is perhaps how the cold capitalism that Depp represents can be an enabler for evil deeds, but this is undermined by the comedic scenery-chewing Satanists. Fairly fun, but light fare and inessential. The Pianist, 2002 Considering many of his films are relatively small scale, The Pianist is expansive in a way no other Polanski film is. It's also arguably his most popular work, certainly his most culturally significant since Chinatown, winning Best Director and Best Lead Actor Oscars as well as the Palme d'Or at Cannes. Is it his best film? Not in my opinion, but it is easy to imagine that for many people it is not just their favorite Polanski film, but perhaps their favorite film by any director. Often described as Polanski's most personal film, The Pianist is in fact a close adaptation of Wadislaw Spillman's autobiographical account of his miraculous survival in the Warsaw Ghetto, that Polanski embellishes with certain memories of his own time there. Adrian Brody plays Spillman and perfectly performs the degeneration of a popular and talented pianist into a skeletal, anemic ghost. The popularity of this film may come in part from two things. The insatiable appetites audiences had for Holocaust films in the early 2000s, the grimmer the better, and a return to the formalistic, polished filmmaking from Polanski. Although the trend has thankfully meandered in recent years, there was a real thirst for often exploitative Holocaust films throughout the 90s. Best exemplified in the great success of Schindler's List and Life is Beautiful, these are films which present the Holocaust in fictionalized, fantastical realities. In Schindler's List, the Holocaust is reduced to the most exciting, violent events, and in Life is Beautiful, a totally fraudulent version of a concentration camp is used as the background to a children's fairy tale. These films had a tendency to be popular with both critics and audiences, and they often became popular tearjerker films. Or in other words, the audiences used the horror of the past to give themselves a cathartic emotional reaction. The pianist could also be accused of this, but Polanski removes the contrivances and grand narratives of formulaic drama scripts. While everything in a conventional film narrative is a direct result of a various character's tangible actions, 
as visible in Schindler's List, which finds its protagonist in the Nazi who attempts to save the lives of a chosen number of Jews. In The Pianist, Spillman's survival is shown to often be based on blind luck. Certainly his sheer drive to survive in many circumstances gets him through and he is far from a passive protagonist, but just as often are times where he only lives because the Nazis knock on the neighbor's door instead of his. Many scenes are memorable and horrific. Unlike Spielberg, who turns the search for hiding Jews in Schindler's List into a game of cat and mouse that is perversely thrilling for the audience, Polanski shoots much of the violence from the removed perspective of an observer, as Spillman often is. The camera almost never leaves Spillman's limited perspective. This reduces the pornography of the affair as the violence is often realistic and distanced, making it difficult for the audience to enjoy in a visceral way. There is also no more than a cursory focus on corpses, as they become an ever-affecting part of the scenery. Much has been made of the most expressionistic trick of the film, gradually draining the color from the mise-en-scene as the film continues. This potentially gimmicky idea is achieved tastefully by basing the scenes around increasingly bleak seasons, the last scene before the epilogue takes place in snow, and increasingly paler locations. I believe this is a great film, but it is not one of my favorites from Polanski. It paradoxically feels so personal to Spillman that it doesn't feel as if it escapes being an adaptation and entering the realm of personal cinema. This is compounded by the formalistic filmmaking style, swapping out the experimentations of Death by a Maiden with its gritty, shaky style and Bitter Moon for a more Hollywood-ready style. This will be a positive rather than a compromise for many audiences, but for me it adds to the slight lack of Polanski's personality that the pianist contains. Perhaps it is telling of the American Academy that Polanski won his Best Director Award for one of the few films that it is less obvious he directed. The success of the film reinvigorated an interest in Polanski's work after several decades of relatively muted reception to his films. Oliver Twist, 2005 Like Macbeth before it, there is very little to say about Polanski's straightforward adaptation of Oliver Twist. The story is so popular and widely adapted already that Polanski's version is only a fairly insignificant footnote in the history of the tale. Polanski's first film to have a child in the lead role, the performances of the children are passable, but not outstanding enough to be memorable. Ben Kingsley is the standout performer once again as Fagin, giving an enjoyable, lovably scummy and pathetic energy to the character. Victorian London is presented at full expense with lavish production design and atmospheric, rain-drenched locations. Ultimately, though, this is the least interesting and least essential Polanski film, because it blends in with the hundreds of other Dickens adaptations without standing out particularly. The Ghost Writer, 2010 Having created two large-scale period pieces in the 2000s, it wasn't until The Ghost Writer confusingly also titled within the same film as The Ghost, that Polanski would direct a film set in the 21st century. The most is made of it too, with comments on contemporary political issues like state torturing of suspected terrorists, and an emphasis on cold, modern technology, especially within cars. The color scheme predicts the sharp, desaturated appearances that would flood television dramas for the next decade. This is still his most pristine and polished looking film to date, taking the formalism of the pianist to the point of perfection. The plot is a captivating, down-to-earth thriller, similar to Frantic. Like The Ninth Gate, the protagonist is notorious in the literary world, this time as a ghostwriter of biographies. Ewan McGregor brings a great deal of natural likability to his never-named character, succeeding where Depp failed. The subject of the biography is ex-Prime Minister Adam Lang, played by Pierce Brosnan. The story is a return to Polanski's strengths, namely the Kafkaesque sense of a naive character entering a world far more twisted than they had expected. First, McGregor learns the previous ghostwriter was found mysteriously dead on the beach of Lang's island home. Then there is the odd dynamics of Lang's house, his deeply resentful wife Ruth, trapped with him as he sleeps openly with his assistant. It's not entirely new ground for Polanski, but it is given a political twist by the scandal the house finds itself dealing with as Lang is accused of torturing suspected terrorists. 
In classic Polanski fashion, the plot expands from a semi-plausible beginning into a Hitchcockian fantasy of the ordinary man forced to commit extraordinary feats of escape to survive capture. As McGregor begins to discover odd discrepancies within Lang's biography that point towards something scandalous happening under the surface. The greatest sequence in the film is an unconventional car chase scene, as McGregor has to evade trackers, directed with real excitement and tension as McGregor only just manages to get on and then off a ferry in time to escape his followers. The trick that makes it work so well is by presenting a seemingly dead-end situation, confusing the audience with the protagonist's seemingly nonsensical actions, and then finally proving that they had a plan all along, bettering not only their would-be captors but the audience too. It's as satisfying as any of Cary Grant's violence-free escapades in North by Northwest. Not since Chinatown has a Polanski film had so many shocking twists, although it is a lot more fun this time around. A highlight is the unexpected killing of Lang, who is shot by a protester from the top of a building. The scene is presented with the confusion and shock of a real-life political assassination, the audience helpless and confused. It's a brave move to kill off a character with no specific foreshadowing or warning, and it discombobulates the viewer, readying them for the epilogue. The final reveal is that Ruth was the ideological force manipulating Lang the whole time, something McGregor realizes only to be immediately killed, at least that's the implication, by a car, likely targeting him in league with the CIA, as the only clue to Ruth's importance. The manuscript blows into the night, it's a great final shot and realigns Polanski with the tragicomic ending he has not indulged in since The Tenant. Somewhere between a farcical satire of political conspiracy theories and a genuine critique of how twisted the power dynamics of politics can be, it's a wonder it took Polanski so long to make a film about politicians, but this is certainly as good as you could hope for. Carnage, 2011 with its all-star four-actor cast and a great deal of popularity, Carnage was unsurprisingly one of the earliest Polanski films I saw. It is perfectly enjoyable, but has a sense of underlying pretentiousness that is carried over from the original play. It is the most poorly written psychological inquiry by Polanski, because it attempts brutal honesty but falls on results that are hardly revelatory. The premise is original and potentially exciting, Two sets of parents have a meeting over the fight between two boys, which starts civilized and ends in chaos. The cast is also full of proven excellent actors, Kate Winslet, Jodie Foster, John C. Riley, and Christoph Waltz, who give good, if sometimes overwrought, performances. I have never been a big fan of the melodramatic soap opera practice of characters yelling and screaming at each other, which the last act of this film does devolve into. The film has little of Polanski's personality within it, but is similar to some of his other material on a surface level. This is his fifth picture to be set primarily in one home location, and while it's not as good as any of the others, it's still distinct enough to avoid retreading ground. The issue that the limited location causes in this case is that the theatrical origins of the story are obvious the whole way through, and compared to his adaptation of Death by a Maiden, Polanski cannot shake the question of why this had to be adapted into a film. Still, it is suddenly entertaining to watch the clashing of the characters' held ideals. Like the Greeks riding battles between gods to figure out their ideologies, this film finds a resolution to the question of who was right or wrong by summoning the god of carnage. Christoph Waltz's character comes out as the victor, despite his initial rudeness, because he is the only character to truly realize the pointlessness of the parents' meeting. Yasmina Reza and Polanski's script breaks down the persona of each character and Waltz is left as the character who has been the most honest from the start. The wider implication is that the best way to deal with the violence of life is with acceptance of its inevitability. There is a further gendered level of analysis the film puts on its subjects, where the men accept the violence of the children, and it's contrasted with both a genuine outrage at the horror of the events from Jodie Foster, to an outrage of the accusation that her son is evil from Kate Winslet. Meanwhile, the men seem to accept that boys will be boys and recognize how a fight between two boys is not something that merits an accusatory discussion amongst parents. At the end of the film, the boys are shown forgiving each other without the parents anywhere in sight, suggesting another contrast, that the aggressive physical violence of youth ultimately leads to genuine forgiveness, 
while the false niceties of civilized adults often mask genuine hatred. These kinds of statements are where the film falls a little flat. They are simply not insightful enough to stand among Polanski's more knotty and complex work. Compared to the blasphemous anti-Christ creation myth of Rosemary's Baby, the schizophrenic depression of Repulsion and the Tenant, the shocking metatextual morality play of Death by a Maiden, simply pointing out that civility is often false is not such a revelation. When compared to the twisted pitch black depression of Chinatown, the pianist, Bitter Moon, it's downright trivial stuff, and it does not have the sense of wild fun of frantic pirates or the ghostwriter. Venus in Furs Considering it is another less serious work set in a single location and adapted from a stage play, this is much more interesting than Carnage. The casting of Emmanuel Seigneur after a four-film absence, alongside her Diving Bell and the Butterfly co-star, Mathieu Amalric, who is also a similar build to a young Polanski, makes this film much less like a straightforward adaptation of a stage play and more like a playful, personal spin on the material. The material is also unlike any of Polanski's other films. It's less story-driven and functions more as a comedic, modernist reinterpretation of the titular story. It is more in common with the world of theatre than the world of film, where reinterpretation is inevitable as new productions of classic plays are produced constantly. There's something of Rosencrantz and Gilderstern are dead in Venus in Furs, in that its enjoyment is largely based on the assumption that the audience is familiar with a very specific piece of source material. I'll admit that this limits my ability to comment on Venus in Furs, as I haven't read the original tale, although the film is still simple enough to understand. This is also Polanski's first non-English language film since Knife in the Water, and in this case I felt as though I also may be missing some great dialogue due to the translation. With those caveats out of the way, Venus and Fuzz is a singularly enjoyable Polanski film. If there were any doubts anyone had about Sinia's acting ability in Bitter Moon, I loved her, but it was suddenly not for everyone. They should be dispelled by the varied, charismatic performance that she gives here as actress Vanda. Rarely are middle-aged actresses given roles that are so much fun without becoming pantomime or senile. From her attention-grabbing introduction, arriving late and hysterical for an audition to play the lead role of Wanda in the adaptation by playwright and director Thomas, she never stops flipping the power dynamics of the scene. The original play by David Ives, combined with the ever-present scriptwork by Polanski, finds a parallel between the submission to female sexual power in the original text and Thomas's submission to allow Wanda increasing control over the play. The slave and master dynamic is compared to the relationship between actor and director. Polanski and I have seen to lampoon themselves here by having Seigneur constantly criticize the misogyny and sexism of the adaptation Thomas has written. This is partly presented as merely another manipulation tactic Wanda is using to maintain control over Thomas, by pressing on his insecurities over the quality of the script. But there is an, also an element of metatextuality to this. Polanski's films have sometimes been branded as misogynistic, especially Watt and Repulsion, often in relation to the events of his own private life. It is certain that Polanski has a deep fascination with female psychology and has never been particularly sensitive to saving his characters, man or woman, from rape, terror, and murder. This may seem misogynistic to some, but it ignores the reality that Polanski often sides with his female characters. Viewers who see the criticism of New Age sexual freedom in Watt, yet ignore its equally scathing criticism of decadent male sexuality are, in my view, forcing an only half-complete perspective. In reality, few male filmmakers have made so many films with such fantastic roles for women as Polanski has, and Venus in Furs is perhaps the ultimate example of this. Sinia captivates and bewilders Thomas totally until the fantastically surreal final scene of the film where Thomas is helplessly enraptured by the erotic dance of a nude seigneur, or why he is tied to a phallic cactus prop. The reinterpretation of Venus in Fur is clear. It is as much about the sexual power of women as it is about male fantasy. Based on a true story. As of recording, Based on a True Story has never had any real distribution or release in the UK, most likely because of the Me Too movement coming to prominence. Its judgment waned decisively on Polanski, who would find that a world that had seemed to forgive his crimes would now never tolerate him again. The general consensus among my generation of cinema fans is that Polanski is as unforgivably despicable as a director can be. I think Me Too and the following reassessment of many powerful figures is the reason behind this. 
The odd thing is that based on a true story is probably Polanski's most feminist picture yet. It's the first to have two female leads, and unlike most of his other films, the women are not particularly sexualized. Seigneur stars again as the center of a psychological mystery, playing a writer who lets an odd, creepy fan, played by Eva Green, into her house. Gradually, this fan, named Elle, takes over the running of Seigneur's life, even impersonating her. It ends with a crazed Elle trying to poison Seigneur, until it turns out she may not have existed at all. It's the kind of mind-melting movie that was very popular in the late 1990s and early 2000s with movies like Fight Club and The Butterfly Effect that rely on huge twists to surprise their audiences and make them reassess what they have just watched. Based on a true story leaves out the grotesque violence of these films and instead is focused more on Seigneur's central emotional conflicts as the tension of the film. Elle does not cause the problems in Seigneur's life like Tyler Durden does in Fight Club, but she highlights Seigneur's isolation, creative block, imposter syndrome, traumatic family history, and her guilt, culminating in a suicide attempt that is disguised as an external murder attempt. Polanski's usual virtuoso filmmaking is more subdued than normal, the digital photography and banal locations taking away the glitz and atmosphere that is present in most of his other films. Still, the focus on performance and plot are razor sharp. The pacing is very good, making what could be a stale thriller absorbing. The eventually apparent psychological element means that every detail is significant, and that much of the film takes on a metaphorical meaning. When Elle smashes up a blender that isn't working, it's a perfect visual metaphor for Seigneur's frustration with a brain that cannot make disparate ideas combine into a story. Not one of Polanski's finest works then, but still a worthy addition to his filmography. Lightweight and psychoanalytical, still in a higher league than the average thriller released today. Jacques Hughes, 2019. As of recording, Jacques Hughes is the most recent Polanski film to have been released, although it has never had any real distribution or advertising and is only available in the UK and US through platforms like iTunes or ordering a DVD. After a career full of controversy, Polanski seemed to be settling into twilight years, where his work was still enjoyed and seen, but was less provocative and challenging than his earlier masterpieces. Jacques reverses this, unfortunately not through any shocking power of the film itself, but simply in the act of Polanski comparing his own experiences with justice to the Dreyfus affair of the 1890s. The film is one of Polanski's least interesting. It still contains enough raw filmmaking ability to fall into the realm of a bad film, meaning that to date Polanski has never truly made one. But even the usual strong pacing and compelling story can't bring up the oddly clean, desaturated and over-sharp visuals, which single-handedly make the film look like a historical dress-up more than the convincing period reconstructions of Tess and the Pianist. The injustice of the political situation within the film, where a Jewish officer in the French army is convicted of being a spy on poor evidence due to anti-Semitic corruption, would be the same invigorating material as Paths of Glory and To Kill a Mockingbird, if only the film was being made by a director who had not himself fled the justice system. While accounts of Polanski's own case involve elements of judicial corruption, it is poor for Polanski to compare what he went through as an admitted sexual abuser to what happened to a totally innocent victim of bigotry. Most of Polanski's films have at least a few set pieces and images that stick with the viewer for a long time afterwards. Jacques, while it is diverting in the moment, doesn't have any of these, and so fades quickly. Conclusion What makes Polanski special? As we become more sensitive towards sexual abuse within society, certainly no bad thing, especially within the film industry, there are increasing calls to stop funding the work of Roman Polanski. It is likely a main reason why his two most recent films have been unable to get distribution in the UK. It is hard to defend Polanski against calls that his work should no longer be funded or rewarded, above artists who have, as far as we know, not committed such awful actions. So why haven't we stopped watching Polanski's films? What makes him one of the most compelling bodies of work in all cinema, a rare director beloved by audiences and critics? There are several elements which emerge when his work is observed as a whole. Style It is clear from Knife in the Water that Polanski has a singularly polished and clean style of filmmaking that has been hugely influential. Inspired certainly by Hitchcock and with echoes of Kubrick's Paths of Glory, 
Across different settings, genres, and cinematographers, Polanski's camera remains omniscient. The exception is when we delve into the character's mind, as in The Tenant Repulsion and Rosemary's Baby, the cleanliness suddenly replaced by distortions and often nauseatingly floating camera tracks. But mostly, Polanski's trick is to show the ugliest acts of human beings from a slightly detached, artistically framed perspective. The style is an important part of a continuum that has led to filmmakers like Michael Haneke, who places direct reference to life in the water within funny games. He took cold formalism, combined with cruelty, to an extreme peak. Polanski's films are not so cold, and while his camera may study his characters more than side with them, his films often have characters who the audience relates to and are encouraged to emote alongside. This is most obvious in The Pianist, which could hardly be accused of coldness as it wrings a great deal out of emotion out of a tragic real-life story. The production design of his films is also unique. Even in his period accurate films, there is an unusually expressive attention to costume and setting. In The Pianist, the gradual draining of color in set and costumes proves that even the most serious highbrow of his films contain these creative choices. Often his films are visually exuberant, filled alternately with either subtle details or grand set pieces. Films such as Watt, Chinatown, Frantic, and Pirates are grand celebrations of visual excess, constantly moving around various ever-changing and varied locations that are mind-blowing to have pulled off. On the other hand, his most memorable production design comes from the insidious closed location apartments of Repulsion, The Tenant, and Rosemary's Baby. This trilogy is a masterclass in set design, as seemingly contained spaces are spun out into labyrinths of psychological horror. The room is a metaphor for the disintegrating mind. Themes Even more so than style, a Polanski form can often be identified via its themes. Although there are several departures from this formula, his films often follow the same basic premise. A vulnerable character enters a world far more twisted than they had imagined. Whether it is Rosemary realizing she is giving birth to the Antichrist, Hugh Grant discovering his attempt at a fling on a boat as part of a deadly relationship, or a pianist gradually entering hell on earth, few of his films depart from this formula. Those that do, such as Repulsion, Carnage, and Macbeth, seem to focus on the mental degradation of the characters into a form of madness. The true outlier to his filmography is Pirates, which is perhaps because it is a much more traditional film aimed at children. The fascination with these ideas of mental destruction and characters trapped in conspiracies echoes what Polanski would have experienced growing up in the Warsaw Ghetto. It is unsurprising he is so fixated on the darker sides of humanity when he has been constantly surrounded by them, possibly why he maintained an interest in the devil across several films, including The Ninth Gate. There is a lot of Kafka and Hitchcock in his films, as characters find themselves unsure of what is happening around them. Sometimes, as in Frantic, the Pianist, and the Ghostwriter, the protagonist grows into a superhuman genius of his own survival. Other times, the character is totally helpless to escape their oppressors, as in The Tenant, Rosemary's Baby, and Tess. Finally, some of his most powerful work is more oblique, as the central characters escape unscathed but having witnessed the depths of human cruelty, as in Bitter Moon and Chinatown. Unlike many directors, his work often ignores heavy intellectualism in favor of populist filmmaking. With the exception of Watt and Venus and Furs, he strives for his films to communicate their stories as clearly as possible to the audience. This does not mean the ideas within the stories are compromised, as there is a great deal of philosophical debate and thematic interest to most of his work. Rather, Polanski uses his library of cinematic devices to communicate these ideas clearly to a wide audience. This has given his films a great deal more popular appeal than those of, let's say, a Michael Haneke type figure, whose films are often impenetrable and unpleasant in style as well as substance, as great as they may be. Sex Polanski is obsessed more than perhaps any other director of his generation with sex, which factors into almost all of his films in a major way. Whether it is a fear of sex as in Repulsion, demonic sex in The Ninth Gate, or an exploration of the dynamics of sex as in Knife in the Water, It's a Moon, and Venus in Furs, it is always a factor in the story of his films, with the notable exceptions of The Pianist and Oliver Twist. His films often linger on the results of sexual abuse as well. Death and the Maiden, Rosemary's Baby, Chinatown, 
most telling of the film's cul-de-sac and what, which may be the films Polanski had the most narrative control over, and a bizarre collections of depraved sexual endeavours. Characters and acting Polanski seems to cast actors through a combination of extensive auditions on one hand and choosing actors very specifically on the other. This varied approach to casting seems to work excellently since there is barely a duff line delivery, let alone a bad performance in any Polanski film. This primarily comes from a combination of solid casting and good writing. Polanski's films are often adaptations of plays like Death and the Maiden, Carnage, and Venus and Fuzz, or classic literature such as Macbeth, Tess, Oliver Twist. Theatre, even more so than film, is a medium where character rules, and this tendency finds its way into many of Polanski's other films. Knife in the Water, Rosemary's Baby, Repulsion, and The Tenant could feasibly make great stage plays, since the focus is primarily on the interactions between the characters in a limited area. The casting is never less than perfect. Polanski's clout meant that for a long time he was able to get almost any actor he desired into a film. He was turned down several times post Chinatown by Jack Nicholson, but each time another actor would come into the role who would make it equally great. His gallery of male leads is formidable. John Cassavetes, Marcello Mastriani, Harrison Ford, Walter Matteau, Hugh Grant, Adrian Brody, Ben Kingsley, Ewan McGregor, Christoph Waltz. But it is in his female leads that Polanski's films find their most iconic performances. Sigourney Weaver, Catherine Deneuve, Faye Dunaway, and Dylan Farrow can all point to their work with Polanski as arguably their greatest performances. A special mention must be made again of Emmanuel Seigneur, who becomes the only actor to appear in more than two Polanski films other than Polanski himself. This may be the most curious thing about Polanski as a director of actors. He liked the repertory of regular actors that most other auteurs gradually built up, such as Scorsese working with De Niro or Bergman working with Liv Ullman. Seigneur is the exception to this. Dark humor. Finally, Polanski's best work is characterized by dark humor. Even in his pantomime comedies, Polanski rarely tells a joke that could be considered innocent. The murder of the landlord in Repulsion, the ending of Rosemary's Baby, the exaggerated phallic objects and sexual metaphors of Bitter Moon all turn their thriller material into something that can only be described in relation to Polanski, adding humor into pitch black scenarios. While his full-blown comedies can be a little gaudy, Polanski's best work emerges when the audience is enjoying itself before suddenly being shocked by a left turn of the plot. Polanski has consistently great pacing, and humor is a major ingredient of this. When humor is missing from one of his films, as in The Pianist or Jacques, it can leave the picture feeling a little impersonal. So why watch a Polanski film? Polanski may not have the total idiosyncrasy of other directors, who have pushed experimentation, cinematography, and psychology to further places and more immediately obvious ways. His influence is less obvious and his past is filled with controversy, but ultimately no other filmmaker so consistently played upon our fears of isolation, of feeling overwhelmed by a system we do not understand. His work, technically flawless throughout, stares in the shadows within us all, our madness, our evil, and our fear.